Hello, and welcome again to Beyond the Bottom Line. Today, my colleague Paul Roth and I will be interviewing Jonathan Bailey as we talk about uh, responsible investing. Uh, Jonathan uh, is a managing director at Newberger Berman, an asset management firm with about $300 billion under management. Um, Jonathan previously served at McKinsey & Company as a, an associate partner, as I recall, and also worked for former President Al Gore and former Prime Minister Tony Blair in the area of sustainability. So he's knowledgeable in this area. So let me begin. We talk about responsible investing, ESG investing. What does ESG stand for and how big is it? Well, thank you, Larry Paul. It's uh, really nice to be here. So ESG is uh, an acronym for environmental, social and governance investing. So it's about thinking uh, when you're picking a company to buy, whether it's an equity or a bond that that company is issuing, about what are their environmental practices? How much carbon are they emitting? What water intensity is, are they using in their production? Or the social issues. How do they treat their workforce? Do they have appropriate diversity in their leadership teams? And then governance. Are they protecting the rights of shareholders? Are they compensating the CEO in a way that's aligned with long-term sustainable growth? Or is the CEO being overpaid and inappropriately uh, incentivized? So those are the sort of things that we want to look at when we're evaluating a company with a view to E, S, and G characteristics. And, and why do we do it? Well, we do it because ultimately we think that better run companies are more sustainable and they're going to be able to uh, deliver better value for their customers and then ultimately better value for investors. Before we go forward, I just want to make one thing clear in the interest of transparency. I'm on the board of Newberger Berman. That's right. So I want <laughs> everyone to understand it. So we're being transparent. Where does the initiative come from from this? Is it from the client mm. or is it from Newberger? So, I mean, ultimately, we, you know, we are uh, working on behalf of our clients. So our clients uh, will say to us that we think this is important. Um, but we also think it's important ourselves, right? I think um, if you look at our credit analysts or our equity analysts, you know, they will be able to say to you, when I look at company X, these things are material to cash flows. They make a difference, in their view, to the medium to long-term performance of these businesses. So even if a client isn't asking about this, we're still thinking uh, about these ESG characteristics. But many of our clients are explicitly saying, we want you to invest in a responsible fashion, and they're asking us how we do that and how we can customize the portfolio for them to reflect their values and their objectives. If you believe that, um responsible investing increases long-term performance. Is there any difference between how you manage a portfolio that requests responsible investing and how you manage a portfolio that doesn't request responsible investing? So um, it's, a, it's a great question. The, the way that we would think about it is, um, in general, we should be considering these ESG factors just in normal analysis of a company. And, and so it, on one level, no, there would be no difference. However, some clients will have very specific things that they care about, right? So if you are a pension fund um, who represents healthcare workers, we have clients for whom that's the case, they may have uh, views on excluding certain sectors or certain activities regardless of price. So even if we were able to find a very cheaply priced company, um, and we think that the risk from an environmental and social governance perspective is manageable, in, in some cases, those clients wouldn't ever want us to own it. So this often happens with tobacco stocks, for example, right? right? So, so th and that won't be the case for all clients. So, so they will have their own preferences. So there will be differences between portfolios um, as a result of, of that. Um, and That's the investor-specific yes. requirement. That's right. If you don't have any investor-specific requirements, are the portfolios managed essentially the same? I think the question is more about the depth of analysis and the uh, time horizon over which you think these factors might affect cash flows. So let's take you know, something like uh, climate change, right? Um, there is, it's highly likely that over a seven year horizon, many more companies will be affected by climate change than over a six month horizon, right? So the type of time horizon you've got as an investor does make a difference to how you're gonna weight different factors. And how do you do the weighting? Yeah. How do you measure climate change against the uh, equality of earnings, gender diversity, how do you do all this? So, I mean, ultimately there's a lot of judgment that has to go into it. Um, so you can't just buy a, a rating off a shelf and kind of plug it into a computer and kind of get out a portfolio. It's, it, it does require a lot more judgment. Um, and so an example would be in the chemicals sector. So chemicals, quite dirty on the whole, a lot of energy use, a lot of emissions, uh, worker health and safety concern. So on one level, you might say, 
I don't want to touch the chemicals industry. But the chemicals industry produces plastic. Plastic is being used by car manufacturers to replace steel in cars, which helps improve the fuel efficiency of vehicles. It's being used in, in aircraft engines and, and in aircraft uh, composite bodies as well. So, so the products can be used in a, in a responsible way that has a positive impact. Equally, some of the leading chemicals companies are designing their plastic products so that they're combining recycled plastic with new plastic to make them uh, basically more sustainable. So what we want is we want our chemicals analyst to be digging into each of the chemicals companies to understand which one is being most sustainable and responsible in its practices and overall then take a judgment as to who they think will win relative to their peers over a five to ten year horizon and that's what they do. How do you prioritize different issues of ESG because with each company I presume some are going to rate pretty good yes some on on some aspects of it some are going to rate not so good yeah I mean suppose you have a, a company that is extremely um, conscious environmentally but its governance practices are such that there are no women on the board sure how do you deal with that particular issue or, the, or pay equity doesn't exist as a principal matter for this company where, where does that take you so um, I, I think you pick a couple of great uh, uh, points because we've done a lot of work on the historical performance of companies and actually which factors have affected stock price. And something like board diversity actually does materially affect stock price. So companies that have better diversity on their boards do in fact, on average, relative to their peers within an industry, perform better. Over and there's the evidence to support yes, that? We've, we've done our own research on this. And there's also research out there from, from other um, academics and, and, uh, and, and consultants and so on. But, but it does make a difference to stock performance. Other things like overboarding. So if you've got board members who are sitting on 10 boards, right, they are just not spending enough time. I don't know how many boards you're on, Larry, but um, <laughs> uh, hopefully not 10. Uh, <laughs> not even close. <laughs> but you know, if, you, if you're on too many boards, you're not spending enough time focused on managing the risk in the business. And, that, and so there are things like that that we can say that regardless of the other factors, you know, we're going to push back on. So when we are voting proxies, right, when we are um, uh, going to the annual shareholders meeting and have to decide whether to support a candidate for the board, these are things we care about. Um, now, the environmental and social issues are also very important, um, often a little harder to measure historically because the data is, is a little uh, weaker. But where we have been able to measure it, what we find is that it's very important to be sector specific. So the issues that matter to a bank are very different than the issues that matter to a pharmaceutical company. You know, in, in pharmaceuticals, we're going to care about things like opioid addiction. Right? We're going to th care about things like the, the pricing policy uh, on, on drugs. We're going to care about things like the, um, the responsibility that they're taking towards the production process. Right? Whereas in a, in a banking sector, it's going to be a little bit more about risk management and fair lending practices. So we're, we try and find the small number of important material factors specific to that industry. And then you end up with something that is relatively clear for the analyst to measure but also for us to engage with the company. And do you have a series of weightings for this? Yes, yes. So each sector, we have different weightings on these different factors. Um, and we do that, you know, each equity analyst, each credit analyst is doing that, combining their judgment, you know, 20 years of following these companies, you know, with the academic research, with uh, my expertise, my team's expertise. Um, so it's a, it's a collaborative process. So, <laughs> um, how do you express your displeasure? <laughs> um, is it simply by not investing or disinvesting, or do you become more active uh, on behalf of the funds that you manage, whether it be a separate account or a mutual fund? So um, we think of it as a, a bit of a sliding scale, right? So you, you know, you start with just dialogue at um, uh, at meetings with management teams, right? So uh, we have something like. Uh, 1,500 meetings with management teams here in New York in our offices each year. 
Um, and in those meetings... You, That's you, not only you. No, yeah, I, I wouldn't have anything else to do. Um, but uh, but of course, our analysts and our, and our portfolio managers. Um, and then, you know, within those meetings, right, you know, sometimes we'll be talking about the, the firm strategy, we'll be talking about, uh, you know, about the CEO succession, but we're often asking about environmental and social and governance issues too, about uh, last year, about 591 of those 1,500 meetings covered an ESG topic. So, so that dialogue is happening in a, you know, a, a construct collaborative way on an ongoing basis. If that doesn't work, right, if we say we're concerned about overboarding or we're concerned about gender diversity in the leadership <coughs> team, uh, then we'll, we'll write a formal letter. Um, and many of our teams have done that uh, with their portfolio companies, uh, either on broad issues or very company specific issues. Um, that often results in a good dialogue and, and action. If that doesn't happen, then we'll go to public letters. And then if that's not uh, working, then of course we can use the, the votes that we have and sometimes the ability to nominate directors if, if necessary. And how often do you actually vote against management on the um, proxy? So the, uh, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna forget the exact proportion we did last year, but we voted against management um, uh, on about 14% of executive compensation plans last year. That's a lot. Which is quite high, yes. 40%? 14, 14, 14. 14. That's still a lot. Um, we, you know, so, so that's an example of, that's all across 4,500 companies <clears> globally, right? So, um, you know, so we're, and these are companies we've chosen to buy, but we're still saying, you know, we, we don't actually think that, that the comp plan is, is structured well. If you take all of the votes that we could, could have cast, um, you know, so, so board election, uh, compensation, shareholder proposals, in about 49% of those four and a half thousand companies, we oppose at least one thing. So, so about half the time, half the companies were opposing at least one thing on the ballot. Um, and that could be just one director or it could be the comp plan. Um, and so it's, you know, we're not doing this, uh, you know, willy nilly. The, the point is to, to be thoughtful and to be using the, the responsibility that we have to our clients of, of voting these proxies uh, to reinforce our guidelines and our approach to good governance. You, you mentioned pharmaceutical companies yeah. before. Um, how do you deal with the opioid epidemic and pharmaceutical companies? I mean, I think it's a classic example of something that maybe five years ago was, was just not uh, focused on by investors sufficiently. And so, you know, if you think about um, bondholders, right? Bondholders are, are always thinking about contingent liabilities and, and these kind of, these risks of litigation that might not be uh, currently kind of priced and that, that they might end up um, being hit by. And so for our, for our, our fixed income investors, mm. this is a real focus of engagement with particularly the smaller, more focused uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies to understand what steps they're taking uh, going forwards. And they have been engaging with these companies over the last couple of years to try and make sure that management is, is taking appropriate action to constrain the risk and to and to act responsibly um, you know there's a on the equity side you know similar uh, similar approach it's 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 about ideally trying to identify these risks before that they become too material you know right now I think the very hot topic is cybersecurity data privacy right this is a an issue that that there is poor disclosure by companies on we know it's a material risk across many sectors and so we need to be out there uh, explaining to management why they should be doing more and the board in particular, why the board should be overseeing that risk, um, you know, to make sure that it doesn't end up hitting the performance of the company and, and, and obviously ultimately hitting society. I'm interested in how you change your ratings also. Mm. And um, I was taken by a story in the paper a few days ago, I guess a few weeks ago by now, that McDonald's in uh, the UK uh, announced that it would no longer use plastic straws yes. and instead would go to paper straws. Yeah. How do you factor that in? And of course, then they would take it to the United States once that's done. How do you factor that kind of change into your ratings? You know, I mean, so one of the factors um, on the restaurant, fast casual restaurant industry is looking at waste. Um, now, the discussion on waste is moving on. And as you say, plastics is such an important issue now. I think we're only just beginning to realize the damage that plastic does, particularly in, in oceans. Um, so it's great that, that McDonald's has actually shown proactive leadership in making the commitment to shift from, you know, from plastic straws to, to, um, to paper and recyclable uh, straws, biodegradable straws, because it shows that they're acting sustainably and acting responsibly on this issue. There are others in, in that sector who are, are not doing that. And so for us, that would mean that we'd actually take a more positive view on the ratings for McDonald's, uh, even though they haven't yet done it, 
but forwards looking, right, than their peers. Um, we also think that things like their decision to move towards uh, fresh beef, right, is another sign of them going in the direction of a, a more sustainable approach. Do they do it out of their own initiative or do you think they're feeling the pressures <laughs> of people like you? So there, there was a shareholder proposal this year in the United States specifically on straws, uh, really? on plastic straws. Um, which I think got you know, something like 25% support. So it didn't pass. Um, and part of the reason for that was I think a lot of investors, including ourselves, saw that the, the company was taking steps voluntarily. But just having the proposal filed uh, helps send a signal, even if it doesn't pass. And it's really important that shareholders continue to have the right to be able to file shareholder proposals um, you know, at, a, at, a, at a reasonably low level of, uh, of stock holding in order to be able to send those signals. I have a, a house in a town in Westchester, and the town council is dealing with the issue as to whether or not to ban plastic bags. Yes, yes. So how do you deal with that in terms of your investing with respect to supermarket companies? Yeah. Well, I mean, the, there are jurisdictions you know, where that's, that's gone through, right? And right. plastic bags have, have, been, have been banned or, or charging uh, you know, a nominal amount, that's, and it has driven down consumption. Um, you see it in countries as diverse as the United Kingdom and Rwanda, um, right? who've taken a stance against, against plastic bags. So it's, it's the sort of thing where you know, ultimately, um, you know, for, the, for, the, for the, the supermarket chains, uh, you know, they actually often benefit because they don't have to pay the cost of producing these things. So it's actually a positive for them. Um, and it's also a way for them to engage with their customers in a, in a different, uh, different way. A lot of them will produce you know, an alternative uh, system, you know, reusable bags and so on. But I think the, the broader point uh, about that is to show that, that regulation often does play an important role in sustainability. And if companies aren't doing enough proactively, then the regulatory intervention you know, may force them to do that. And that's why we often see that the most sustainable companies are the ones who are taking these steps voluntarily, trying to help make sure that their, uh, their end use by their customers is more sustainable before it needs to be uh, regulated in. Um, and that's the right thing to do. You, you look at a company like, uh, like Unilever, often thought of as a, a leader on sustainable business. They're spending a lot of time thinking about water use by their consumers. You know, how can they get consumers to brush their teeth without running the tap? Um, and that's the sort of the small things, right, that are saying we, we have a responsibility, you know, to uh, the planet and to people that's broader than just uh, the profits we're making on selling the product. You know, you were talking about plastic. I read an article not so long ago that there's a dead zone in the Pacific filled with plastic that's larger than the state of Texas. I mean, it's incredible, isn't it? It's, it's extraordinary. And you think of what happens as the, as the planet, you know, as we mm. are fortunate to have more people and, and continued growth in emerging markets, uh, you know, not tackling that now uh, is, is going to be a real problem. So I think, it's, I think it shows um, the, the demand from, particularly from millennials, um, but, but it's not just millennials, but, but the demand from a more uh, kind of environmentally aware uh, community to, to look at these issues and to see them as being the responsibility of business and government to solve. And that's part of the reason why, why we're seeing demand for the types of investing that we do. Um, because more and more people are saying, look, I'm, I'm doing something with my life and I'm choosing to work for a company that I think is responsible. But then why is my pension plan <laughs> investing in companies that aren't acting responsibly, right? That's a, that disconnect is, is troubling for a lot of people. And so they want options on their pension plan uh, that allow them to express you know, their belief in sustainable businesses both because it reflects their values and because they think when they retire in 20, 30, 40, 50 years that they want to live in a planet that, that reflects a more sustainable future. Well, how about the retiree who's going to retire in five <laughs> years? <laughs> We're very lucky that the U.S. Uh, is at a high employment uh, part of the cycle. Um, you know, we have high friction of, of, of job changing. It's, it, we're in a, in a really great place and, and uh, long may it continue. And that means that if you're gonna be invested in companies that are treating their workers right, you know, are thinking about appropriate pay practices, um, are dealing with harassment in the workplace, um, are making sure that there's gender pay equity. Like these are issues that matter right now over the next five years um, for, for these businesses. So, you know, there's a lot of things that we should be seeing in the short term too. How, how do you deal with the business that decides to relocate its factory from a small town 
and decimates the workforce of that small town. Is that something that you take into account? Wait a minute. We just gave that on a final exam. Give him <laughs> well, a I'll, final you know, exam. Uh, we'll give him a grade. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I'm going to pass. It's a, it's a real challenge, right? Because there are, um, uh, there are clearly impacts of those sort of decision making. And, and, and ultimately, if businesses are doing that on a regular basis, and that's where their competitive advantage comes from, from just shifting production around, and that's worrying, right? Because it means they're not going to be as welcome. They're not going to benefit from training and investing in the skills of a workforce that won't be there in the in the medium to long term. But they're and, going to get a short term benefit out yeah, of it. Yeah, and and I think long term investors can see through that and see that as being as not being a sustainable advantage. Um, you know, one of the one of the examples that um, one of our, our analysts I was talking to the other day covers the chemical sector, and, and, and we were talking about health and safety in, in workplaces. And uh, this particular company is going through a, um, a cost-cutting exercise that will involve some reduction in, in facilities. And one of the reasons why uh, this analyst still believes this, this company is doing the right thing is that management is hell-bent on focusing on health and safety during that period, because what you don't want to do is to be cutting right. and then not investing in worker health and safety, right? And so there are, you know, we can say that we like the rationalization strategy because we think it's appropriate for the shift in the, in the business model, but, but you can do that in a way that is responsible. There's no metric that allows you to pick that out, but by having analysts who physically go to plants, right, and talk to management, talk to workers, um, that's the sort of stuff that we're trying to assess. What about when you have dialogue with companies and the companies absolutely refuse to do the kinds of things that mm. we're talking about today. Does that happen very frequently? And if it does, yeah. what's the end result? I mean, ultimately, if, if a company's not being constructive, then, then we wouldn't want to invest in them, right? I mean, that's, that's ultimately the end point. But I'd say more often than not now, you know, investor relations professionals, CFO, CEOs, you know, are becoming more aware of how important this issue, issue is. How about the dialogue with an investment manager or an analyst um, who loves company XYZ, yeah. and you're critical of XYZ for all kinds of reasons, and they say, in, for the next six months or a year, this stock could do God knows <laughs> what, and you're saying the next 10 years, this company could get in trouble, and they say, I won't be here in 10 years, don't worry <laughs> about it. Well, that's where you need to have the, the right compensation structures so that, that portfolio managers have uh, you know, some consequence uh, to their decision making beyond the next six months and they're invested in, uh, you know, and we, we do that. We have a lot of deferred compensation at, at Newberger to make sure that we're taking a long-term view. Um, but the broader point is fair, which is that, uh, you know, it's a dialogue. Like, I, I don't have a monopoly on, on the truth on this. Um, I don't know every sector in the level of depth that um, the analyst who covers that sector or the portfolio manager does. And that's where, you know, they, their expertise and their judgment is really important. Um, but there are times where they may have overlooked something. And that's where my team can really help. The SEC is now requiring <clears throat> average compensation to be measured and compared to CEO compensation. Mm. Is that something you pay attention to? One of the things that we have found is that, uh, from some of the, the, the research that we've done, um, is that you know, CEOs who are very highly compensated, not always, but sometimes that can indicate um, a lack of control by the board um, and a lack of challenge. And so it can be something that, that, that can be put into the context of other information to understand whether this is potentially a, a risk to the business and whether the CEO you know, is, is, is being given the appropriate um, uh, constraints by the board. And so you know, that's one indicator, but I wouldn't want it to use it you know, bluntly. I think it's important to put it in a broader context. Jonathan, is ESG investing slowly becoming the norm? You know, I think it is. Uh, last year, over half of our clients um, asked us about ESG issues when they were deciding whether to invest with us. Right? And that's up in North America from 5% three years ago. So it's, it is, I think, becoming something that everybody feels is a part of good ten investing. Ten times? Yeah, ten times over three Ten years. times growth in three years? Yes. Now, that doesn't mean that they're, they're making all the decisions based on that information, but, but ten times as many are asking about it um, uh, last year versus three years ago. Um, and obviously it's higher in Europe and Australia, but um, I think this is globally... Uh, as you say, Larry, becoming much more of a mainstream. Is industry ahead of government now, let's say in the United States, are we accelerating this process as I think, opposed to the I think regulation? In the, yes, I think in the United States, I think business, both companies and investors, I think are, are accelerating. In, 
some businesses, I think, are ahead of investors on this. I think, you know, um, you look at a company uh, like Nike or Unilever, right? They are doing much more thoughtful things around this than, than, uh, than many others. Um, Europe is going down a more regulatory driven approach um, to this topic, um, you know, and we'll see how that shakes out. Which, one do, which uh, form of uh, achievement <clears throat> do you like better? Do you like the regulatory approach or do you like the I think voluntary should, approach? I think we should be doing this because it's good investing, right? That's, I, and I think that, that allowing ourselves the flexibility to innovate is, is the best approach. So, that's, so I think if we do our jobs well, um, we may not need a, a regulatory intervention. So this is a really a capitalistic approach? I think so. And it's, in the and long it's run, a long term. Better. It's about creating value for our clients and, and creating a world in which you know, we all want to live. Just one last question. Do you think we do better because companies that invest this way and act this way get into less trouble? I think that is part of it. I think the other part of it is that they also uh, grow, right? If you are making products and services that are more efficient, you know, and that ultimately create more value for, for customers, you're going to win market share, you're going to grow. So it's both about opportunity and it's about avoiding. Well, I'm very happy to have this conversation with you. I'm still a little bit confused as to where Larry and I invest. <laughs> <laughs> because that's short term in your view. But um, Jonathan, this has been a fascinating conversation. Thank you very, very Thank much you. for sharing your time with us. And uh, to our television audience, we hope you enjoyed it as much as we do and that you'll join us for the next episode of Beyond the Bottom Line. Thank you.